airway emergencies. I'm Tawakir and I work at Nottingham. And I'm a PD&T surgeon and this is my passion. So please forgive me if I turn out to be too passionate for the audience. Um, pediatric airways. We all start getting jitters when we get a call. And we are told, oh, there's this child with stride or in ED. Actually, with a certain structure, we don't have to worry because actually it's quite simple. Everything in life requires a structure is the way I look at it. And it's actually understanding the pathophysiology of the pediatric airway and also learning to appreciate the, the pediatric patient and uh, how quickly they can go the other way, but also the time of intervention and when to intervene. So I'll just go through some considerations first. We all know that children are tiny. They actually have a lower respiratory reserve. It's because their lungs are smaller. They do consume a higher amount of oxygen because of their high metabolic rate. And as they are smaller, and we all know about Pasul's law, I suspect, is that their airways are smaller. And with a smaller airway, any swelling or edema within the, within the mucosa of the airway will have an increased impact on the pediatric airway than it would be on the adult airway. As you can see, in the normal airway, for the adult, it's 12 millimeters down there, and the pediatric is about four millimeters. When there is a narrowing by one millimeter of muco on the mucosa, in either one of them, you can see that the pediatric airway will reduce by up to 75%, whereas the adults just about 30%. So the pediatric patient will become more symptomatic quickly. So what are we looking for in children? I think it's understanding when you go into ED, this child's stridulous. They, they do have breathlessness, but it's the increased respiratory rate that we're looking at that I would find more convincing as a symptom of uh, impending acute airway obstruction. Hoarseness and aphonia is quite important because, you know, in epiglottitis, they have a sudden change in voice. In quinzes, although not very often seen in children, they can be seen, you will have a change in voice. Croup comes with its barking cough. Dysphagia and retropharyngeal abscesses and other abscesses within the throat, parapharyngeal, sore throat. But when you listen to the stride or in ED, there's a lot of noise. Do we want to, do you think it's easy to understand whether it's an inspiratory strider or it's a biphasic strider or it's an expiratory strider? I don't think it matters really. I think it's important to understand that there is strido in the child and that it is important that we class that as an emergency and forget the rest of it. Because actually the child will then dictate what management plan that we're going to run with. So there's the other issues of drooling that you can have in various pathologies, which we'll come to later. Retractions, tracheal tug, subcostal retractions, head bobbing in a baby. You know, I came to a lecture a few, a year ago or so, and Michael Coyle from Birmingham was talking about it, and he was talking about his experience as a registrar. And he said, you know, he'd gone and seen this child, and the pediatric surgeons were saying, oh, you know, child is, the, the child has an airway issue. So he went there, the child was smiling a little, head bobbing, he said, but it was quiet, so he went back to his consultant and said, oh, I think it's fine, you know, the child wasn't noisy at all, uh, just smiling and kind of head nodding at me. So they went there, and the child apparently had a tracheostomy about an hour later. So it's important to be aware of that silent child, that nodding head, and I see that quite a lot in uh, laryngomalacia, particularly the children who suffer with some degree of uh, obstructive sleep apnea in them, or indeed... Uh, a failure to thrive. So how do we go about with children? Children are a little bit more complex. 
They come with a parent. There's a degree of emotional distress there. So it's important that you turn out to be calm and everybody around them is calm. So when you go there, you're not going to touch the child. You're going to have a look. Oh, hello, Harry. You know, look at, look at the, listen to the sounds he's making. Look at the vitals. And if necessary, start some resuscitation maneuvers. That would include dexamethasone, adrenaline, nebulized, and oxygen. But don't forget to ask for help early. We, we, you know, we, we all love to be heroic, but actually in pediatric airway, the best thing is to ask for help and work together with your pediatric anesthetists. Do not instrument the airway at all. So uh, F and E means flexible nasal endoscopy, but I wouldn't touch the child's airway with a spatula either. And there's a new role where there's high flow nasal oxygen, and if the child tolerates it, you can potentially provide high flow oxygen because this will give a peep to the airways that are kind of collapsing in some patients. So as I said, with regards to the strider, it can be any type of strider. It's important to realize it's, it's, it's a symptom of acute airway problems and the degree of work of breathing with the subcostal recessions with the tracheal tug. And then with regards to feeding problems, it may be an acute history. Maybe you're seeing a child who's with laryngomalacia, who has been having feeding problems, failure to thrive, come at three months of age, and he's still like three kilos, the same size that he was when he was born. So what are we looking at? So pediatric airways, sometimes when you take a history, that kind of gives you a diagnosis. So understanding what's happened before birth and at birth is quite important because if they've been intubated, have been in NICU, or have had multiple intubations with surgery, those are things that you would like to understand because that would increase the chances of certain pathologies. Comorbidities bring along, for example, in Down syndrome, you can get uh, subglottic stenosis. You have de George syndrome. Again, you get uh, a web in the larynx. Uh, in coronal atresia, you get the bilateral, and in charge, you get bilateral coronal atresia. So those are all important things that you want to kind of tick on to so that they can kind of give you a working diagnosis quickly. And the timing of symptoms will also indicate to you when, uh, where, wh as to when the strider started and how long it's been there for. So child was born fine at birth. You take a few weeks on and starts getting a little bit stridulous. But as they're carrying on, they get more and more stridulous. I mean, I'm kind of thinking hemangioma. Something's growing, yeah? Or it could be laryngomalacia because it's, it wasn't there initially, but it started a few weeks on. But you've kind of started narrowing it down. And then you can ask about exacerbating factors, i.e. exercise intolerance or feeding, etc. An airway will be symptomatic when it's significantly narrow. So up to 75% narrowing will be manifested by stride or in patients. So that's your examination in ED, really. You're not doing any more. I wouldn't do any more. I go there and I make a plan. And then we start thinking as to when you do a flexible laryngoscopy. Certainly, I wouldn't do it in ED. I'd do it in theater in an acute child. Um, and then knowing our kit, the rigid endoscopy. This, you know, we do have a pediatric airway trolley within the hospital, and that's an amazing thing that you can have for those people who are dealing with pediatric emergencies. So you have a certain set of vital instruments that you're going to use all the time. In certain patients, you might want a CT scan or a chest x-ray, such as the forearm bodies. So for those who don't practice pediatrics on a daily basis, the setup of this can be quite tricky. And even as an ENT consultant, you know, I, I tend to go and give teaching on putting this together, retrieving uh, foreign bodies in simulation, etc. But I always tell my registrars to have a way of remembering this. And the best way I remember it, I used to remember it, now I do it quite often, I don't need to pick my phone up, but on YouTube, you have a video with Oxford Medical uh, and 
they've got a fantastic, succinct video on that uh, showing the setup. So if you've got an immediate, uh, an emergency that you're going to take the patient to theater, then I'd consider opening the, my phone, your phone up and looking at the YouTube. So that's the rigid bronchoscope. The sizes of those vary uh, in different children, and there, there is a, the, the formula of age over four plus four is quite useful, but, there, but you can find online certain uh, cards that you can put in your wallet or snapshot onto your phone. Causes of laryngotracheal obstruction. So those that have been kind of circled are the ones I see most commonly. The others come along. Uh, supraglottic area, the laryngomalacia is the most common airway pathology that any one of us will find. This is closely followed after, uh, not quite closely followed, but it is followed by vocal cord movement Im impairment, and that could be bilateral or it could be unilateral. With time, our neonatologists have got better. So in the past, we saw a lot of acquired subglottic stenosis, but actually we don't see that many. And when we do, it's actually not so bad as it used to be. So acquired subglottic stenosis is the other one, and the treatment of it, if it is at an early stage, is uh, pretty effective with balloon dilatation. And then we see infective cases. I think the infective cases of uh, airway issues are the most common. And then you come to congenital ones, and then laryngomalacia is at the top of your list. Papillomatosis, respiratory, recurrent respiratory papillomatosis used to be quite rampant, and I've seen probably in my four years as a consultant, I've only seen one new patient appear, and that's really because of the Gardasil and the quadrivalent vaccine that patients are now being immunized with. It is on the downturn. Okay, in Australia, I saw none on my fellowship, and they're saying they don't see any new ones anymore because they were, that started the quadrivalent vaccine way before we did in the UK. So I've kind of tried to summarize in terms of the stride and the, nat and the age of which the patient is born and the pathology. So in a newborn, immediately they have stridal. What is the most common thing you're going to kind of think about? Think about their SATs, vocal cord palsy would probably be the most likely issue. When they're a few weeks old, you're kind of thinking laryngomalacia, subglottic hemangioma, congenital subglottic stenosis. If it is kind of mild in, in congenital subglottic stenosis, you would see it manifest in the newborn if it was quite severe. In those children who've had intubation histories, and it will stay in PICU for a while, they may have acquired subglottic stenosis. And then as you get older and you get exposed to the various infective uh, microbials around you, you, get the, you, you can get various uh, pathologies there. So vocal cord dysfunction. In neonates, this is one of the most common causes of stridor other than laryngomalacia but this is the most common strider presenting immediately at birth in these children. It can be acquired depending on the type of birth these children may have, so that is something to take note of. And it's important to see if there is an Arnold-Criari malformation in this, so we would MRI this. It's quite important to do the MRI because in Arnold Chiari, once you identify it and you manage the Arnold Chiari, 50% of these vocal cord dysfunctions will improve. There is variability as well in the way vocal cord mo mobility impairment does, come, uh, does develop and is managed. Some don't need a tracker depending on how they're managing, but I think we find that about 50 to 60% of these children will need a tracheostomy of which 50 to 60 percent of these will recover in the next four years, and it can be up from it can start improving from quite early on in the first year up to four or five years of age. 
when we're a few weeks old. So let's see what happens. You've got a two-month-old infant come to you through the pediatricians. Oh, I've seen this child. They've got a little bit of tracheal tug. Mom is saying that they're not feeding well, taking forever to feed. At night, mom reports apneic episodes, you know, holds their breath, and they're quite worried about them. And they're not thriving, so they have failed to thrive along their centiles. So what do we think this is? So my first diagnosis would be that. And you get various severities of uh, laryngomalacia. You get the prolapsing arytenoids into the air where you get a very tight area epiglottic force and a very tight omega epiglottis. So what, what do we do with these children? I mean, a lot of these... Oops, where have I gone? Yeah. A lot of these children, you, you would... You wouldn't need to rush to theater. You could start them on conservative management like some PPIs or ranitidine. Put them on an overnight oximetry, see if they're apneic, look at their centiles, and you could do a semi-elective surgery for these patients with a supraglottoplasty. For children, like the case above the first one, you've got an XPREM child, they come with their own problems with chronic lung disease and oxygen requirement and have had multiple intubations. We are thinking about a subglottic stenosis of an acquired type. Second one is a four-year-old who's had treatment for a tumor in the head, has had radiotherapy, has been intubated for a long time, and has had two failed extubations, which means he's had repeated intubation as well. That what is the diagnosis there? Again, you know, PIC will contact you. We can't extubate these children. Could you please help? We take them to theater. We do a diagnostic uh, laryngotracheal bronchoscopy on there. And most likely, we're going to find one of these two issues. So we've got right there, there's stenosis there. After balloon dilatation, kind of improve it to that. We've got... That's another sub. Uh, there's some granulation tissue which will eventually turn into a subglottic cicatricial scar, which will cause uh, a subglottic stenosis in that child. Or you may not have subglottic stenosis, but you may have subglottic cysts there. And these can reduce the airway significantly as well. So when we think about subglottic stenosis, we've got to remember about our grading system and uh, Cotton Meyer. Uh, in the 70s, came up with this scale. And this actually, after the age of six, seven years of age, it doesn't really correlate with the airway, I would be, uh, I, I have to add. So we all know the grading, and I think that's available in every textbook that we can find. And I'm going to give you at the end an answer of how to go about it very easily. So with subglottic stenosis in these children in pediatrics, I think you'd get your pediatric anesthetist to, in theater, to intubate with the smallest size tube possible. You take them back to PICU, and then you decide and manage the child with a team approach, looking at the patient's family, the background, and what we can do with them. Of course, if it's a simple fix with a subglottic stenosis, that's not too uh, rigid and that is soft and has granulation tissue, for example, you, you could consider balloon dilatation. And actually, balloon dilatation, I find in my experience, helps in the grade one and the grade two, early grade twos. We would take them out for extubation, but you would give them some good going dose of dexamethasone and try to minimally uh, address the... Uh, yeah, instrument the larynx at that stage to reduce any further edema. So how would we do that? Treat with reflux before they come to theater, steroids before extubation, and then have CPAP available ready. I think high flow nasal oxygen in these children is really good, and we're using more and more of this because it's actually quite tolerated. Endoscopic optimization with marsupialization of the cysts and dilatation of uh, simple stenosis and granulations. 
But for those that you can't do any of this, you have to con start considering a tracheostomy. And then for those who are in teaching hospitals, cricoid split and single stage uh, laryngotracheal reconstruction is considered, and I'd advise that, that, be, that the child be referred appropriately. For a three-year-old suddenly attending AD, don't know what's going on. Their breathing suddenly got raspy. What else do we want to know? It could be anything content. It could be infective. It could be a foreign body. So we kind of look at this slide I find is very helpful. And it gives you an idea as to when the onset happened, the age, and some of the symptoms and noises that you can have for the various types. So let's, let's start with the first line there with croup. <coughs> Children with croup will wake up with a barking cough. Generally, they don't need to attend ED. You just stick them into a shower. The dampness and the steam kind of helps. But if that doesn't help, if the children go to ED, and some may need some dexamethasone, often it's simply treated with oral dexamethasone, and they don't need to do anything about it. There is a small group of patients who will not respond immediately. And uh, those will then need uh, adrenaline nebulizers. And then if they're worse, which is, I must say, a very rare event, it's not very often that we get a call from PICU that they've had to intubate a child who's got croup. But if that happens, I think the worst thing that, can, that we should do as an ENT group of surgeons is succumb to PICU's pressure and say, oh, yeah, we'll take them to theater and have a look at their airway. Because actually... That's the least of the worries at the time. You just need that larynx to settle down, give them the relevant medical management, and they should do better, and uh, plan for an extubation about 48 hours later. Foreign body aspiration. I don't know how many of you guys have found Lego in the airway, but I find a lot. I wish Lego knew about what it did to the children. But anyway, we often find children coming in with their parents saying, oh, they start coughing, choking. Sometimes it's a witnessed episode, which is lucky, because you know there is a foreign body there. Often, it isn't. Parents don't really know what's going on with their child. We've had a child who's had multiple visits to ED at various times in a different center, and then was with a pediatrician, and the pediatrician says, it's just not quite adding up. You know, is there a foreign body? Has anyone excluded a foreign body here? And the, the changes on the chest X-ray, unfortunately, are very subtle sometimes. So we've always got to have that in our brains at the back, thinking that it could be a foreign body. It may not be very evident because most of them are unwitnessed. And then chest X-ray shows various uh, different uh, signs and it can be normal in most occasions I find that they're normal and then you suddenly take them to theater and there's a whopping foreign body there that you take from one of the main bronchi or subdivisions. Unfortunately foreign bodies don't like being opaque um, and then knowing our kit, having the kit, investing in the kit. Our units may say oh it's you know it's a lot of money but actually it's not a lot of money when you're thinking about a life that could be saved. And you, I think every unit should have it. <coughs> any, any unit that does pediatrics should have the ventilating bronchoscope and the optical forceps. And the forceps come along in three different types. There's the peanut grabbers, which I find quite useful. But also there's the alligator-like uh, ends. And they can be helpful to extract the edge of that one there. So... The, the pincer type will go in there and you can pull it out. Uh, that would probably require the, uh, for a peanut, the peanut graspers. Sometimes, however, and this has been more recently my experience, you find a child coming with a foreign body that's been there for a long time. You take them to theater and you can't see anything. It's all grubby because it's infected, it's granulated, and you can't pass your rigid bronchoscope through or past the area of the granulation tissue. All you're doing is making more bleeding within the lung. Come out, come back another day, give that patient some dexamethasone, and wait for a week. 
give them antibiotics, get your respiratory uh, clinicians involved. And I must say that we've done that in a few patients and it's worked very well for us. Thankfully, we don't see this due to the hip vaccine. And we've kind of discussed about how we manage these patients at the beginning. Important thing is managing it in theatres, taking the child with their parent into theatres and doing it in a controlled manner. When you're in theatres, get the kitchen sink out. I have no, no problems doing that with, this, with my pediatric airway patients. I tell the nurse, I want a scrub nurse with a tracheostomy tray. I want a scrub nurse with two light leads with a bronchoscopy, uh, ventilating bronchoscope. And then you're hoping that your anesthetist is going to save the day and intubate that child. But if they don't, you've got your ventilating bronchoscope and you've got your tracking kit available. And, if, and the other thing that really helps is a Hopkins road with a railroaded ET tube. Yeah. Your anesthetist will give you a certain view. Just go in and with the bronchoscope, you may not necessarily see a lot, but you'd see the epiglottis curling in, but you can, ha you, you can actually have a good view of the uh, post cricoid area, and you're aiming at the front and that little bubble that comes along. So see the bubble, and where the bubble comes is where you're going to intubate the child. And then the rest of the stuff that's required for treating the infection. Sometimes you get a call from the neonatology department and they tell you, oh, we've just delivered and the child's going blue and gets better when they cry. This is something we don't see very often, but if we do, we know what it is. It's going a latresia and it comes along with a whole host of uh, associated uh, malformations which we would look for. But before we take these children to theatre, we need the CT scan, we need to clean their nose before they go in for their CT scan and ensure they've got an echo so they're safe in theatre under a GA. They will do fine with, the, uh, with, their, with them intubated if they're, running, if they're having significant difficulties or a McGovern nipple and orogastric uh, tube for feeding. So... What I want to say about pediatric ENT, and it's vital, is can you see that team there? That's the anesthetic room. And we as ENT surgeons love our toys. And there was this new ambuscope that had been available to the ENT guys. This was a toy for the anesthetist before, and now the ENT surgeons in our unit also use it. But what it does, it allows us to capture images on that thing and then send it across to the various people that require it. But there is a child that what we're doing is an azendoscopy, but with that ambuscope, I could provide suction and I could go right down to the carina and come back and do a bronchoscopy with that in the anesthetic room with the child being on high flow oxygen. I didn't even need to go into theater at that stage. So it's learning to use new kit, but also looking at the bodies there, the number of heads around that small child there's a lot of close team working. There's a shared airway. So that's something that we need to be aware of. The key points for this morning, if you're going to take anything away, is be calm when you're recognizing the tired child with, with stride or an airway compromise. Make a quick assessment without touching the child often. You don't need to touch the child. And then calling for help early. Calling for help with your pediatric anesthetist and I work very closely with my other pediatric colleague. And I think if there is a child who I think is going to be challenging and is working day at time or night, I will have no hesitation in calling my other colleague in. Ensure that in your area where you work, you've got the emergency trolley for pediatric airway resuscitation maneuvers uh, at the top of your head with adrenaline and dexamethasone. And then knowing your kit and having that kit available to you for dealing with these. And I did promise you how to go about the subglottic stenosis, uh, addressing how, what the percentage of obstruction is. There is a mobile airway card that's now available even on the Androids, because about a year ago it was only available on the iPhones. But this will give you an idea of the pediatric airway sizing, 
the grade of scale, uh, the grading scale of the Cotton Meyer scale is all available on an app, which is free. So it's worth having. Um, the one thing that we need to understand is that pediatric airways will present in different ways, at different conditions, and actually recognizing those and working very quickly and uh, well within your team. So making sure that you go for frequent well, you, do, you can't really go for frequent coffees with your pediatric anesthetist, but sometimes you might want to buy your pediatric anesthetist a cup of Costa and uh, maintain a good relationship with them. I think uh, that's us at Christmas, and that's how, what makes pediatric ENT fun for those aspiring young ones who are still not subspecialized. I would certainly recommend pediatric ENT as one of the subspecialties in, intra, in ENT. Thank you very much. Any questions?